John's Jeffrey Lurie. I'm good, how are you? Trey, it's Jeffrey Lurie. I'm good, how are you? I miss you. I gotta let you know, uh, I've been wanting to do this. You are elected to the Eagles Hall of Fame officially, man. You and John Runyon are gonna go in together this fall, uh, and I can't think of uh, two better guys to do it. When I look back on all those great teams, I, I, honestly, you epitomize those teams. Andy and I used to always talk about that. Uh, you have 53 John Runyons and you're gonna win almost every game. So, uh, man, you are, you, are, you are the epitome of an Eagles Hall of Famer and you're gonna be inducted this fall. Trey and John, welcome back to Philadelphia. Welcome back to Lincoln Financial Field, our locker room. Congratulations to both of you, Class of 2021 Philadelphia Eagles Hall of Fame. Let's start there. The feeling that you have being in the Hall of Fame, what it means to you. Man, it's, uh, you know what, it's just a lot of excitement. You know, um, I really am happy about getting acknowledged, you know, uh, for the body of work that we put in here. I mean, and it's something you never really think about when you're playing. You know, it's one of those things when you're, and you're an old man, you're talking to your kids about it, you know, someday you'll be talking to your grandkids about all this kind of stuff, but even in real time, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great honor, but also the, the friends, family, fans, and all that kind of stuff on social media that I'm sure you got it too, Trey, just reaching yeah. out saying, congratulations, well-deserved. It mm -hmm. you know, makes you feel good that you're, you know, you're still respected for what you did on the field out there. Yeah, certainly well-deserved. I mean, look, the, the Eagles offensive line was a mess before you started here in 1998, mm -hmm. left tackle, right tackle 2000. We're back here at Lincoln Financial Field in the locker room, guys. Um, you walk in here, do you, do you feel something when you walk in? Oh yeah, well this is the house we helped build, man. I mean, you know, I started out in the vet and then to be here, I know it, they had just started breaking ground for you here. So, I mean, you know, this is the house that we helped build and it, it's just awesome to just walk back in this locker room and, and see that everything is still kind of the same. You see a couple of different things on the walls and stuff like that, but it's still the same, same. The Eagles are on the clock, but they haven't waited that With long. With the 11th pick of the first round, the Philadelphia Eagles select tackle from Florida State, Trey Thomas. Guys, long before you came to the Eagles, the days of Buddy Ryan, the offensive line never really came together. It started with you, Trey, 1998 draft, first round. Were you aware of the history of left tackle in Philadelphia? No, I did not know anything about the history of left tackles here. So you came here and you just focused on you being you? Just getting better, uh, learning as much as what Juan could give me, you know. Um, just from the first time that I took my first trip here, uh, when you go on the little draft process and you fly around to the different teams, and I remember coming here, and it was late at night, it was dark, you know, and Juan took me out on the vet turf at night, and there was no lights on, and we're out there doing vertical sets on the turf on the vet, and I just put my suitcase down, and I'm in street clothes, and we're out there doing vertical sets, and I'm like, man, this is the coach that I need to play for. I wonder if your work doing sets, vertical sets at the vet, you're going to go, this coach has a little crazy. Yeah, no, I wanted that. I wanted someone that was going to push me, someone that was going to make sure that he taught me the right thing. I wanted someone that was going to, uh, you know, have to invest that energy in me. You know, um, I wanted the coaching, and that's, that's what I got from Juan. He is the best right tackle in football. He's the best right tackle in football, bar none. And uh, we're very privileged to uh, to have him here. They did their part and stepped up and you know, and I'm standing right here at this podium now. John, your arrival was different. You were the highest paid offensive lineman in the history of the NFL, for a minute anyway. A month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why Philadelphia? You know, it, it was just one of those things where the stars aligned up, aligned. You know, it was opportunity. Obviously, you know, Andy had gotten here the year before, but obviously 1999 wasn't a great season. So you kind of, you, you kind of saw the change, you know. I knew Trey was here, you know, you had drafted Donovan the year before. So it's like, you knew you had some components around, but at the end of the day, what, you know, and I said that in my, in my welcoming press conference and it blew people's minds, like, why'd you come here? I goes, for the money? I goes, yeah, but it has to be a good fit, you know, even, even to Trey's point, like, you know, sometimes Juan can be a little nutty, a, 
aggressive, abrasive, yeah. and all that. Yeah. And like, I go back to my college days. I, Les Miles was my offensive line coach at Michigan, so it was something I was okay with because between the O-line coach and your, your O-line buddies, you're spending 90% of your time with those guys, so you got to be able to fit in and, and have fun. And uh, Trey was one of those ones that always kept that room light and laughing and all that kind of stuff. Take us behind the scenes. You visit Philly. You hadn't signed yet. Um, why, what happened? How did Andy convince you? I mean, you know, how did it happen? Well, I always say this, though, too. I goes, when, when there's a contract offer out there that you don't have to think about, the decision is made for you. And it was that. Like, I had, coming out of Tennessee, you know, we had just lost the Super Bowl that year and kind of knew who had cap space and who had needs at offensive line. And it was just a fit. And I came here. I'm sitting in Andy Reid's office, and the coach's assistant comes down and tells Andy that Jeff Fisher is on the phone. And Andy gets up turns the phone on, hands it to me, and walks out, the, walks out of the office and closes the door. He go, he's basically said, you're not going anywhere. He goes, but please talk to Coach Fisher. And, you know, Coach Fisher was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's like, I'm going to become the highest paid offensive lineman in the history of the NFL. Like, that's what I'm doing. Because I knew the what offers around the table previous to the 1999 season before we went on the Super Bowl run. And then you look at the cap space, it wasn't there, so it didn't make a lot of sense to stick around. And this was an opportunity, you know, and it's one of those things like, hey, it all worked out at the end of the day. The Eagles, for the first time in 24 years, are headed to the Super Bowl. Look, four straight NFC Championship game appearances, one Super Bowl appearance, five NFC Championship games in all. And the fans are focused on Donovan and Brian Westbrook and all the pass catchers. The offensive line, the consistency of the offensive line, do you believe it ultimately was largely responsible for that run of success? Well, look at it. How many backup quarterbacks did we have back behind us that won games for us? Yeah. You know, and that's a sense of pride for us. It doesn't matter who we're putting back there. Yeah. They're going to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Frankly, you know, go back to Donovan sometimes, like, he was a little too confident. He'd be holding on to the ball way too much. Yeah, he'd be a Where a backup it. guy, he's like, there's my read balls out. Yeah. Made our lives easier. But Don was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to this and try to get the shot down the field because he knew he could run with it and, and take care of that. So he, he would actually make it a little more difficult on us. Yeah. But I think, you know, when you look at, I think a team is only as good as their offensive line. You know, uh, you can, you know, because if you have a bad offensive line, man, your team isn't going to do anything. You're not going to be able to run the ball. You can't pass the ball. You know, teams that have the weaker offensive lines, they they're not successful. You know the game won and lost by us, dog. We we protect the line. And you got to thank some of your opponents because they make you better. And I'm going to be honest, there are two guys who made me so much better. One was the meanest guy I've ever played against in my life. Eric Williams from the Dallas Cowboys. And the other, may surprise a lot of people, is um, John Runyon. Philadelphia Eagles. And John, I know you're here, Congressman Runyon. I know you flew in to support me. There you go, big guy. Why don't you stand up so they can see you? 6'9", 350 pounds of twisted steel and non-sex appeal. It's pretty cool. Michael Strahan goes into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He mentions you. Your reaction when he mentions you and your thoughts on that rivalry. You know, it's out of respect. You know, guys being inducted in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, you know, we've battled, God, somewhere in the realm of high teens 20 times against each other. And he's one of the best to, to ever do it. And I know he made me check myself. I changed my stance. I did other things that I used against everybody, but changed just to battle him because he was getting underneath me all the time. And even though everybody thinks that, you know, I had so many battles against you and I was winning and everything, I, well, I was, but <laughs> you, you won, you won quite a bit of battles, man. And you were the toughest guy that I've ever had to face on a consistent basis. And you made me a much better football player. And after watching these films and you don't play anymore, your right foot gave away everything you were gonna do. <laughs> but I love you, John Runyon. John, you mentioned the offensive line room and Juan Castillo. Um, give, me, give me a little bit about Juan. What, what kind of coach was he? What kind of guy was he to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? 
he's a workaholic, first of all. I mean, he'd always want to be Andy into the office and leave after Andy left. I mean, I, I know there was three or four days a week where he didn't go home. And we would always get on him like, Juan, like, sleep is part of this process. Like, you're not going to be able to communicate and coach unless you're rested. It's kind of like cramming for an exam. If you stay up all night, you know, science tells you, get a good night's rest, you'll probably do better on the exam. <laughs> and then we, we used to kill him all that, all that time, but Juan's all about business and he's all about grind. There you go, nice. All right, now just keep him, man. Good punch, but go ahead and keep your hands on him, all right? Not bad. Here we go, on one. Why did he son? The man took a John Deere flush to the knee and still came out to practice. <laughs> Broke his kneecap, crushed his kneecap, and still came out there to practice. I remember one time he was having one of his kids, and he was like, hey, man, you know what? Yeah, she's going to have a C-section. The C-section is at 3 o'clock. Let's finish this film. Yeah. You know, and I mean, you know, he was all about getting work in, man. That's, that's I think we actually went up to Andy and told Andy, and I was, Juan's not going to see the birth of his child. Like, yeah. you need to come down here and tell him to leave. Yeah. <laughs> like, He's like, oh, yeah, the that's how he was. at 3 o'clock. Don't worry about it. I, got, I have time. Don't Did worry he? about it. I he eventually he laughed, but he yeah, got yeah, the but film in. Yeah, he took it to the last <laughs> second there. I think he got there right before the baby came out. I mean, you know, it was, that's how Juan was, man. Well, he certainly cared about you guys, and he appreciated you guys. And John, I want to show you something. Um, your, your reputation was what? Some people call it dirty. <laughs> I think everybody. <laughs> Some people call it dirty. Yeah, it's in the gray. But <laughs> you got to walk the you walk the line. But really, it's it was. Getting chippy with people, getting physical with people to get in their head. That was, well, that was kind of my advantage. Like, I'm not as good an athlete as he was. My thing was, I'm going to go and I'm going to give you a forearm in the back, kind of push you over the pile a little bit, let you know I'm around. And at some point, you're going to try to fight me. And when you're trying to fight me, now I have the advantage because you're not trying to beat me in this game. You're trying to physically assault me. I'm just messing with your head the whole time. I love it. Well, here's something that Juan said about you. Take a look. You know, John finished plays. You know, if you want to say that's dirty, well, you can say what you want. John Runyon played with heart. John Runyon finished. When you finish plays, you become a physical player. He went until the whistle blew. You know, and, and, and that's that's easier said than done. You know, offensive linemen are bigger. They're probably, you know, people talk about they're not as athletic as the defensive guys. But what John was, John was in great shape. You know, John could run all day, and, and that's what helped him finish plays and keep after guys. And, and I think to, more than anything, you can say that, you know what, John finished plays, and he played until the whistle blew. You know, if you, if you want to say that's dirty, you can say whatever you want. Most people, that's what you want. Your reaction? I mean, that's how I was wired. So my whole thing growing up where I grew up in Michigan, was watching University of Michigan football and those guys flying around, just pancaking dudes over the bench and that kind of stuff. And that it still gets my blood boiling today, that, that type of stuff. To actually latch onto a grown man and grab his breastplate and uh, deposit him on the ground, that made it all worth it. You know, and that, that's what it was all about for me. Uh, I'm not sure your style would be described as the same as John's style. How would you describe your style oh, left tackle? I, I had a little bit more cream in my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that, uh, but Ryan and them, man, y'all was so wild, dude. Like, everything they did in games, they did in practice. I remember we were in training camp, and they come flying over the pile. I'm like, man, what? This is just insane. We used to do it like, you know, we would have those periods in training camp where it's live, tackling yeah. the ground. I, I'd go to Jermaine Mayberry, playing guard next to me. I goes, watch this. This, this drill's going to end right now. He goes, what do you mean? I go, I go flying over that pile and hit Brian Dawkins on the other side. This drill is over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they would do it in the practice. We do it every time. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Well, so Juan, uh, you had to be in concert with Donovan, where his drop had to line up with mm -hmm. what your steps were. You were. I always kind of looked at you as an artist at mm -hmm. left tackle. Here is what Juan says about you. That is it. We all know in the NFL, you know, a lot of games are won in the in the fourth quarter, the last two minutes of the game, and I think it it was nice for Donovan. You know, and then to, to know that that Trey was there. I mean, you know, the thing about Trey is Trey could go to Donovan. Sometimes I say, T, man, Donovan's getting too deep. Oh, I got it, Juan. And then Trey would go talk to Donovan and say, hey, man, you're getting too deep on those seven-step <laughs> drops, you know, things like that. They had a good relationship, but Donovan knew that Trey had his back. And I think that's very important, especially at the end of the game. Yeah. Yeah, man. Your thoughts? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we would always be on five about his drops, his cadence. You know, uh, we would still definitely be on that cadence a lot, you know, so that, that was a lot of stuff that we were all focused on. The happiest day of my football career was being drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles. The saddest day was when I left. I really thank the organization for just taking a chance on me back then in 98 and making me a first round draft pick. Um, second, I want to just thank Coach Reed for just always, um, you know, being there and being like a second father figure to me and um, just really just being such a great example. Me and McNabb used to joke all the time because, um, you know, when we would have our post meeting meetings all the time, and, you know, Coach Reed would call us in, and he would always give us this speech about um, Reggie White, Brett Favre. You remember, he used to call us in all the time, and we'd get all these speeches. I'm like, man, here we go. Coach Reed is about to talk to us again about Reggie White and Brett Favre. And it was always the same story, you know. And it wasn't until, you know, when I was just thinking about, you know, with me retiring, that it all came together, you know, what you were really trying to do. And what he was teaching us was how to be a professional and how to carry yourself from being a talented athlete in college and how to put the work into this game to make yourself a legacy, to make yourself a legend. Oh man, I think, I think it's awesome. You know, they, they both fed off of each other. They're, they're, you get two guys that are six, eight plus, and they're in a different stratosphere. I compare it to centers in the NBA. So they have their own camp, right? The centers have their own camp. They're breathing a little bit less oxygen up there. And, and, uh, and they think just a little bit different. And they've gone through different trials when they were the biggest kid in the class and all these things. But they understand each other. Well, in this case, those two challenged each other. I mean, it was fun to watch. I'd sit there and just focus in on practice, and I'd be going, look at these two guys, man, just going at it and trying to better each other and help each other out. I mean, what a blast. Both of them deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, though, man. I'm fired up for them. It's interesting. Post-football career, not an easy thing for a lot of players. And both of you have gone through different iterations of your post-football life, sports media, politician, now with the NFL office. Talk about that, John, finding your, your sweet spot after playing football. You never know. I mean, opportunities are always out there. The great thing about playing this game for as long as we both did and you know, taking care of our bodies and taking care of our, our finances, you can pick and choose what you want to do and you can enjoy it. So it's a very unique opportunity that we have. You know, I've, I've tried a lot of things. You, you know, you brought up politics. Like, I did it as community service to serve my community, and I hated the political side of it. So I got out of it. Now it's just like football, I think it's both of our lives. We're still in it. Our, all of our kids are athletes. We're still around sports. That's what we love. That's what we know. And it, it's awesome to continue to have an influence on the game. John, for those who don't know, what is it that you do with the league office? Well, so the forward-facing thing is really um, administering all of the uh, on-field compliance discipline. So for all the player safety files on sportsmanlike conduct and uniform and branding compliance, there's a set of rules that are laid out in that CBA. So I administer all of those rules for the league office. For you, Trey, also uh, coaching, media as well. Yeah. You've gotten into the paint business. Yeah. Let's talk about what you've done to find that good point in your post-playing career. I think for me, it was just like Ryan said, just try to find what your niche is. Uh, but for me, I think that I like coaching. I've learned a lot throughout my career. So I try to go back and teach it, man. And it's a lot of fun. Like right now, my son is a freshman down at IMG. So I always get in there and watch film with him. And it's just a lot of fun just working with these kids and trying to show them how to play this game. I love being able to leave, leave my fingerprint on this game. Final question, guys, for both of you the feeling you have going into the Eagles Hall of Fame together? I think it's just awesome, you know, just for the both of us to be able to go in at, um, together. After uh, how many years did we play together, man? What, 10? I was here nine. nine, so, nine? Yeah. yeah, so we played <laughs> nine years together. You know, I, I think it's awesome for us to be able to go in together. I think, I think it's a great experience. No, I mean, it is awesome because, I mean, you know, I, I think we said earlier that between Trey and I, we were – those starting tackles for nine years, you know, there was a lot of change in between us and outside of us. Uh -huh. But, you know, to be the, you know, those bookends, as everybody calls us, to have that continuity there, it was awesome. And uh, Trey's a brother, man. I, I love the guy to death. Uh, and it's, it's awesome that we're going to be able to share the field here, you know, come October. Guys, thanks so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. 
and clothes on me. I was fresh off the plane. And Juan had me put my bags to the side, and it was dark, and he had me out there doing pass sets on the vet turf. And I'm just like, you know what, this is where I want to be, and it just happened to work out that way.